morning, Nell. It's very nice to see you in this lovely winter's day. Lovely to see you and Lizelle and to be able to speak to you. It's a great Good morning, occasion for me. It's as always a privilege for Frank and for myself to speak to you and this time to have the privilege of having uh, the first of a series of discussions with you that will be recorded and which will hopefully inspire many of us and many others in years to come. Perhaps I can start with a question. Um, cubism. The question is how and when and why? This was something that grabbed you, you were intrigued by it, you were interested, inspired by it, and that really marks, as far as I can tell so far, the start of a wonderful journey and a wonderful story. Tell us about your journey with Cubism and beyond. You're quite correct, Lizelle, because what I'm doing today is so linked to what I found in Cubism. I couldn't have couldn't have gone on without understanding more about what had happened there. Because when I left Witz, I left with more questions than you could imagine or I could imagine. I was just wanting to understand and to find answers to so many things. We had learned about cubism. It existed. We had learned about abstract art. It existed. But what? Nobody knew. And remember, it was 1950. People didn't know anything about Cuba, uh, about, I mean, about um, abstract, abstract art in South Africa at the time. There were a few people like Eric Laubscher who had gone to uh, Paris a few, I think a year or two, maybe before me, or a year, I think it was. But anyway, we went there to find out for ourselves. And I just loved the inquiring French mind. It really, I felt, I felt happy there. I felt as if it suited me. And um, yeah, then I went to the Académie Ranson, which was related to the Nabi painters. And um, I knew the dictum, Maurice Denis, who was one of the Nabi painters. Nabi, by the way, means prophet. They, f they found them, they thought of themselves as prophets. And um, they came out of Goga, and um, he had said something to the effect of a painting before it is a horse or a woman or whatever object. It is a flat surface covered with areas of dark and light and colors and so on in certain proportions, etc. So you see he's pointing to technique. And somehow, I don't know, at the time I didn't understand it, but that stuck with me. And with that in mind, I landed at Ranson. Uh, it was Académie Paul Ranson. Anyway, there I met the most wonderful colleagues, two of them. It was wonderful to work with the three, with the, with the other two, because they were interested in the kind of questions that I had. And we visited museums and exhibitions, and we never wasted any time. And we spent evenings at the library together, and we went to lectures together, and we were daily in the studio. And the days were so long, but we never got tired because we were just a little bit younger than what you are now. We started to paint for an exhibition at the end of two or three years, and we had that exhibition together. And before that, we met Sephore, and he was very important to me. He was writing up the history of abstract art from the beginning, but also what was happening in Paris at the time. And that book appeared in 1960. Two, I think it was, yes. I was then at the gallery and I helped him with uh, entering a few of South African painters' work into it. What I found there I thought was beautiful things but also confusion. Um, people were all doing their own thing because this new abstract freedom was so fantastic they could they could do whatever they liked, and beautiful things did come out of it, but um, 
there was nothing definite coming out. You could take it or leave it. And um, I thought, well, I can't find any answers to my questions. So I thought the only thing is to go back to where it all started, what was happening then, and where can it take me. And before that, I had looked very carefully at Cezanne, because he actually started people wanting to understand. As you may remember, he said, you can reduce nature to the cone, the cylinder, and the sphere. And um, I was very impressed by the lines he used. He's, he's still alive. The lines were never just lines. They were like little shots sticking into one another and jumping forward. That really caught my attention, and I looked more and more carefully at him. And that may have been the start of it. From Cezanne to the to the Cubists, to I mean, we did discuss last time very briefly that, I mean, uh, Picasso and Braque went through that intensely Cubistic period, and then almost let it go. They never they never truly uh, completed that journey. And I think you said you felt. Uh, very inspired by what they did, but also very inspired to continue that journey, to complete uh, the, the cubism process, almost, so to speak. So maybe Almost a scientific inquiry, as it were. I started working with the, with the cylinder, ach, with, the, with the, the, the circle and the square. And frankly, I don't remember how I first got to it. I wish I could remember, but I don't. And also the origin, why did they use the circle and the square? For me, it was enough to know, well, it had something to do with creation and with opposites and with, with, with duality. And OK, so I use them because they use them. It landed them somewhere, so it should land me somewhere. And what I then found, but not consciously, just all those things just happened. It's only in retrospect that one can sometimes see how they fitted together. But they used the circle and the square to the extent that they totally destroyed the object. So they left an objectless world, a world without an object. And that was a wonderful thing for liberation. It was such a new world. Everything was possible. And that freedom is what every painter celebrated. But they celebrated some of them to such an extent that 101%, and then you know one starts going wrong if it's too good. So I was more troubled by the what I found as confusion than what I got there. So I brought, I came back to South Africa and continued with it. If you had to formulate that question, your, your quest to get to the bottom of something, if you had to put that in one sentence, I know it's difficult, but what would that question be? Painters are always involved with objects, and I wanted to, to know more about the essence of the object. What is it? How can I show it? That's what took me to Cubism, because that's what they actually wanted also. They they, they broke it up, but they were too attached to the visual appearance of the object until they got so involved in their process that they destroyed it totally. But they made beautiful things in the, in, on their journey. I, I, we all know them and we enjoy them so much. And that love of the object, as we see it, as we recognize it, stayed with most people all the time. They, they, they would, I would even in, in, in my pictures, my oil paintings of, 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 um, yeah, of the later 60s, middle 60s, they were still very object directed too. You find them in the works there at the um, uh, Stellenbosch University Museum. They are still object, but broken up. It's only later that they became really abstract. And what is abstraction? It is really what 
What the dictionary says, it says something like um, taking, removing the material from the immaterial, and then you have abstraction. Now that immaterial, what is that? That can be anything for anybody else. But for me, it was movement, seeing people's legs on the street, how they walk and the feet, that fascinated me. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the 50s, I tried to paint it. Uh, not in the 50s, sorry, in, in the beginnings in, in Paris, but I soon gave it up. But then, after ha having been busy with it and then going to, I think, as I told you, to Spain and seeing those boats and their masts just moving and creating patterns, patterns of, of squares and circles where the boat has curves and the water, it was a fantastic moving experience and of movement. And it stayed with me and it found its place afterwards. The sense of movement in, in, in your work was probably the aspect that attracted me personally to it first. Well, that's and, uh, great news. I'm so pleased to hear that because people are so object in love with as they appear. Thank you. And <laughs> I'm still not sure how you managed to create that sense of movement because to me, obviously other painters and famous ones and less famous ones and South African artists, a number of them have tried to portray um, movement. But there are very few, if any, artists in my respectful view, especially in South Africa, that can achieve what you've done. Even somebody who comes to your work, um, I, I would like to say, without context at all, even someone who would come to your work with very little knowledge of art, the first reaction would be, I sense the movement. And uh, one of the wonderful examples are your paintings of horses. Do you want to talk? us a little bit through that movement and how you achieved it and why that was so important for you. I think it, it happened because I didn't destroy the object completely. I left it part of it and that part of it became a sign or it was hoping to become an indication of what it used to be. And that a little bit of, say, of an, of an apple, a certain corner, or of a pear, you see the difference, or of a horse. And that also linked me to my, my, my original subject matter. And I liked that. It sort of worked for me. And then, because it had been broken open, but not completely disappeared, it created a, almost like a catchment area for the space, which is now, now been liberated because it's now opening up to space. Space is invited in, space flows in, it flows around it and away, and there you have movement. It all centers on not having destroyed the object completely, but leaving parts of it as signs or such things, and they are so important. But now, how to arrive at the sign was another problem. Because where do you find a sign? Okay, you work on it. A certain angle gives you an indication of a sign. But then many years later, just as about the time that I started the horses, I did some Ophelia paintings. And that started with... Um, we had a discussion group with Joyce Leonard. She was a fantastic teacher. She posed a model for us one day on her veranda under a sort of a reeded awning. And that cast a shadow of lines. And I looked at this model and these, these shadow lines on this three-dimensional body created a perfect sign on the body that was just a sign, but it, it showed you, I thought it showed you the body. There she was with a squiggle and her arm, and there was Ophelia. And from that moment on, I focused more on signs and it helped a great deal. I think sometimes of that reduction that comes with abstraction and that line that you do, there's something very calligraphic to it. 
And I was interested how you married almost where you started with Cezanne, you, you had the Cubist. And in the end, I, I strongly sense that there is also an, in, an interest with you with calligraphy and, you know, the, the, the flowing lines and the ability. It's, it's, not, uh, but it's not as rigid as, as, as other forms of writing or mark making. And I was interested to see how you almost fuse all these things together. Yes, there is a definite feeling for it. I, 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 I went to, 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 um, to the East in 1982 for the first time. The Chinese painting, I think, is absolutely wonderful. And I feel very happy when I look at them. It, 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 I find answers there which agree with what I'm looking for. Those signs, those, those, they, 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 they are like signs, but they still tend to follow the outline so much. Whereas I go right through the body. I, I try to find the, the energy line, the, the, the tension line that would say from the horse, from the front leg to the hind leg, you know, that is the tension. And, yes. and, and with them, it is still the, the border, which I was trying to avoid. I was working on a few music pictures. It just happened that I liked the flow of it. So one of them is trying to make the background and the foreground flow into and working together to create the flow. And I think, I think I've managed it. I'd like your comments on it. Yeah. It's a bit yeah. full. I would have liked it simpler, but I think it works. And I felt very happy because I've seen that something in the Chinese paintings. But of course, I admire them. They are so beautiful. They are so, they are so clean and clear and resolved. You speak of not being interested so much in the lines as in the essence. You would like to go through the, if, in, in, if, if I may try and put words to it, through the skin of the object, so to speak, right into its very heart, into its essence. Break its tight border, yeah, which encloses it and keeps it isolated. Because you can't help it. You, it, you, can't, you can't separate life and your experience from the thing that you're doing, if you paint. It is just, just there. And then, of course, the shapes also, you, they cannot lie. A shape tells you what it is. I mean, you can try, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. <laughs> Your work speaks of movement, the word essence comes to mind. Your work is about the essence. That is a life quest. And the word that springs to mind, as you've spoken now, whether it's movement of a, of a horse or, or another object, or whether it is the, virtually the sounds of the flow of music, the common denominator for me is life. Would it be fair to say that what you are essentially painting is life. You're giving visual effect to the life force. Yes, it is so. It is, it is that flow because flow is the most, flow was the most trying thing to paint because now you had flow. I had flow in the 50s. In the still life, the, the atmosphere, the background of the old painting or the atmosphere of life was coming in and out of the object. But how do I paint that flow? That was difficult. And in, I will show you in some of the drawings. It took years after the object had been, my object had been broken up and, and, and form a, a, a container somehow for some of the flow, but to actually keep the flow going so that it penetrates the thing and continues out of it. That was, that took years. And there are many things here, you won't think that they are related to flow, but they were trying to discover how can you paint flow. Not that I can do it today, but to an extent, yeah, yeah, it's there. 
And Nell, you, you said um, when we had that wonderful show of yours at Valchemy and, and we were doing the walkabout and some of the paintings that you painted when uh, you just were in Paris and just came back from there about the merging the, the object and the four at the background and make them all almost interlocking faces. They are not, it's not the object before and after. It's all, they're all related. They're all important. They, they all, they all form part of the whole. And I think it's beautiful how you sort of integrate all those aspects uh, into the painting and create through it, obviously abstraction, but the, as I said, there's a certain energy. There's an interaction between the, those aspects that you, that you immediately perceive. Whereas there's nothing static, even in those works, there's a strong sense of movement and of dialogue between the various components inside the painting almost. You said it so beautifully, I, could, I, could, I couldn't say it as clearly. I need people to say it and it's wonderful what you're telling me because that's how it arose. The moment that you, you, had, you had entered the background, you had created proportions of how much background to how much of the of the of the of the sign that you left if there's too much or if the if there's not tension in the distance of the next object or the next frame if that tension isn't there to fill the, the space so that it's not just anonymous then it didn't work so you created an interrelationship the moment you entered the background, you were in interrelationships. And, and as, as you've said, it is flow and interdependence that in the end are the two big things that must be in a picture for me. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And the beauty of it is that it applies on the painting level, on the form-giving level, and in life, you know, it's actually basically a matter of respect and care and being alert to, to interdependence, to proportions, to tensions, and to, to give and take, because the whole of life is give and take or give and receive. And so is it in the visual proportions and relationships that your picture has. In that sense, it becomes a reflection of life. And that makes painting so, yeah, such a vehicle of, of expression of our, our daily lives. Uh, as you say, it's about life, life force, energy, and the structures and forms all are sort of linked together by that sort of inherent energy. That, and the, as I said, life, the flow of life. But, um, for you, um, there's always been a very strong spiritual element to your works and uh, to some of these things. We, oh, that's a sense that one gets, even you know, from the beginning till the, till now. You know, so um, is it a conscious or a subconscious thing? Is it? Um, I you think know, I think it was subconscious, and it has become very conscious. <laughs> and maybe if you can share with us some of the of the sort of spiritual. Uh, building blocks that you believe uh, are, you know, are encapsulated in your work and in your approach to your work? Well, you know, I think I've more or less indicated that, that that is this, this awareness of, of give and take, of, 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 of proportions, of not too much, not too little, have a balance. Um, balance is so important. Okay, it can be a very stretched balance, which is very interesting and very, it, it's strong. I mean, it's, think of your old scale with, I mean, you can have a very delicate balance or you can have a very daring one, but it, it's life. It's life every time. It's not just painting, but painting tells you this about life. It, 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 it is a spiritual thing. It can't be helped. But it all resolves around the object and its closedness and its openness. Because if it is closed, you're isolated and you are... In human life, you would be an egoist. In painting, you would be an old recognized object 
that you only recognize. I've seen it before. It's lovely. It's nice. But that's enough. I'm used to it. I like it. I've recognized it. Okay. No, give me insight. Mondrian said, um, the surface of things give pleasure. Their inwardness give life. And he was the only cubist that went on painting these spiritual values. Delaunay came after a while. Delaunay came back to painting and he painted those beautiful circles. And it was in there, but it wasn't as pointed as in... He, for him, color was his means of expressing these things. But Mondrian had the squares and the lines and the proportions and the tensions, and that was his big spiritual contribution. And you've asked me the question, I think the matter here is the interdependence and flow. Mm. Now, these are topics that we should continue to talk about. They are so important, and I think they are so interwoven into your work. In fact, it's hard to distinguish between you, your work, and this deep spiritual connection. It, again, it's almost like you describe your works, the background, the foreground, the object, it all becomes part of one. So it, it, it is a, a topic that we'd love to explore. And I think there are going to be many more sessions which we really are looking forward to very much. And um, in conclusion, perhaps, we would just like you to tell us um, uh, the, the, the hour that we scheduled for the session is up and obviously we can talk longer. It depends on you, but just in terms of formal structure. In conclusion, um, it would be very good to hear from you what you regard in this process that we've described as one of the greatest insights that you have come to and that has affected not only your work, and your success as a painter, but also your life, and that has had a transformative effect. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? It's difficult to just quickly put my finger on anything else. But the flow of life is very, very important. Without flow, you become an isolated object, and you become introvert and mm -mm, no good. <laughs> Flow is, for me, in the painting, naturally, and in life, I would say number one, to create unity. Because with it, if there's not balance in your flow, you have no unity. And balance is a part of unity. And unity is very important. Everything has its place and its, and its reason for being, and we must allow them to be. But you're very right that it is this energy flow that connects us all. Without that, we are disconnected. And we must, if we become aware of that energy flow, life, we express life. Now, maybe a last question then um, this morning. There's something that I just thought of when you were speaking, and that is almost the word harmony. And then I was thinking about some of the works that you create of the, of the, so of the dance or the, the run or the bird's flight or music. There's, um, I think that seems what you said earlier of balance, of some things being in harmony with each other, you know, harmonious flow of things. Yes, you mean the background and the foreground, if you can, if you can paint them, then they together create a flow, and with a the flow they create a harmony. I mean, they, they, not, they, they work together. That's harmony. They work together, and they, together they create the flow. If they, if they don't work together, there won't be flow. It will be separate. It will be the old object, dead, isolated, boring. Yeah, and sort of like the paintings about that series about germination. If you think about new, you know, life being born, growth, uh, that sort of the seedling just, you know, coming to life and the two first two little leaves and, you know, it's still sort of uh, in, in the fruit, in the nut, say, that it grew out of. And you that sort of sense of 
new beginnings and renewal. Or else decay, slowly going down, ready to go up again, flow. <laughs>